Okay. I'll bring one either this evening or tomorrow. Because you need Are these mics working? Are these mics working? Okay. Bishop Charles Johnson. My name is Jason Crosby. And for the past 12 years, I served as one of the co-pastors here at Crescent Hill Baptist Church. And it took me about 11 years to get to a point whereby I felt comfortable and at home standing in the very same pulpit where John Claypool preached every week. He cast a long shadow for those who were attempting to be proclaimers and preachers that stood in a place where he once stood. However, although that shadow was long, one thing that I always sensed, always sensed, even though uh, I did not have the same gifts and abilities that the likes of Dr. Claypool brought to that, that pulpit, was a spirit of support and encouragement for those of us who were a generation or two behind him, attempting to do our best to deliver a word of hope and encouragement when comfort was needed, and a word of challenge and affliction when those in the pews had become too comfortable. And so it is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this weekend. I am grateful for Rowan, for Susan, for the lecture committee, the planning team uh, that has had a hand in all of this to bring this to fruition today. John Claypool's legacy did not serve as a, a detriment for me and my ministry in this place. It was an uplift. And I sense that we are all here today and we're here for this particular panel when it comes to Claypool's influence and impact on local congregations and the way in which his 
Not only his preaching ministry, but his congregational care ministry made an impact at the local level. Uh, I certainly felt that even though I never met John Claypool, but I certainly operated under his shadow for a long time but it was not a bad place to be. And so I'm grateful today we have a distinguished panel. I'll allow the panelists in just a moment to introduce themselves, but what we have here are representatives from various congregations here in Louisville, in Texas, Baptist folks who connected with Claypool through congregational relationships as well as Episcopalian friends from Alabama, grateful for their presence as well. Uh, I will say, my last Sunday here at Crescent Hill was July 10. 10. This is uh, the first time I have formally been back in this space for an event in the last two months. Uh, And it's fitting that in just a moment, I'm gonna go try to turn on the lights. (laughs) That's what pastors do. And so I will be listening uh, acutely, uh, but I think I know where the circuit panel is, and I might be able to flip a switch. And I sense that part of the reason that John was so effective in the congregational context was not only did he have incredible oratory and pastoral care gifts, he knew where the circuit breakers were. It's an honor to be with you all today. Thank you all for coming from points far and wide to be present, and I look forward to continued engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, We pastors not only know how to turn on the lights, but also how to take out the trash as well from time to time. So my name is Ryan Price and I'm the senior pastor at Broadway Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, the church where Dr. Claypool served from 1971 to 1976. Uh, I also have had the honor of um, knowing what it means to live under that shadow, which is not a heavy one, but uh, a real gift, having also served as senior pastor of Second Baptist Church in Lubbock, Texas, as well, uh, where John was pastor, also a co-pastor along with Hardy Clemens in the 1980s. Uh, in addition to, to those two things, I was also a boy in Second Baptist Church when uh, John was there in the 1980s and have very much enjoyed Uh, the life and the legacy that he left there, and also certainly at Broadway, and uh, am very grateful for the imprint he has made uh, on me and our congregations that we have shared together. So this is a true honor here to be at Crescent Hill, and I wish to thank the planning committee and uh, really look forward to this opportunity for you all to, to hear from uh, uh, various members and, uh, I guess, watchers of uh, John's ministry throughout the years. Uh, The plan today is to move chronologically from your left to right as we walk through more deeply the years of John's legacy and ministry. Um, I wish to thank Doug Weaver for a wonderful, wonderful overview that he gave to us a few moments ago. And also look forward to uh, engaging this material more deeply. We recognize that there are seven panelists and um, some, at least a few of us are Baptist preachers. And so we will try to be mindful of time, but what our plan is today is to walk through this um, step by step with about seven minutes and then at the conclu- seven minutes each with the inclu- the, at the conclusion, uh, then taking the opportunity to just have some conversation and to share some story. And my, my real hope is um, that we will all get a sense of some of what uh, I think Aaron Weaver was talking about at the near end of our time together in that first session 
was not only Claypool as um, a preacher and a public leader in all of the communities to which he belonged, but also as a pastor. And many of us have, on this panel, if not all, have had the, uh, the joy of receiving his pastoral goodness over the years and uh, have all uh, sat under the great benediction that he has given to us. So I'm very honored to, to be with you all. I'm going to introduce everyone uh, person by person. And, uh, and the first two I wish to introduce is one, Alan Culpepper. Uh, Dr. Culpepper is de uh, Dean and Professor Emeritus of the McAfee School of Theology at Mercer University. He retired there in 2016 after 20 years and I had previous faculty appointments at Southern here in town and also Baylor University as well. As a high school student, he was a member here at Crescent Hill and uh, that was during the first years of Dr. Claypool's ministry here. So we're very glad to have you, Dr. Culpepper. And then the other to Dr. Culpepper's left is uh, John Arnett, who began attending Crescent Hill in the, 19, in the 1940s and then moved to Louisville from t Tennessee at about that same time. He was in high school when John Claypool began his pastorate here in 1960 and his parents then later mailed him Dr. Claypool's sermons, which I think will have a theme of that. Uh, throughout the course of the following years. He has also uh, gone on to practice internal medicine. Uh, there are many doctors here in this sanctuary today, but he may be the only one who could actually save our lives. So we are grateful for that. And in addition to, to that as well, uh, he also serves now as church archivist here at Crescent Hill, and we're very, very pleased to have both of you to speak about John's ministry here in those early days of his work in Louisville. Welcome. Now it works. Good. Okay. Well, this uh, this is is coming home uh, for me. Uh, it really feels that way, and uh, at the same time, uh, somewhat surreal to be sitting uh, on the platform here, where the pulpit stood, where uh, John Claypool preached Sunday after Sunday, uh, while John Arnett and I were uh, high school students here. Um, uh, memories are fresh, as I know they are for many of you, uh, so that it, uh, in some respects, almost seems uh, as though it were yesterday. Um, I want to make just a, a couple of comments. Uh, first, uh, how we refer to him, Claypool, Dr. Claypool, John. Uh, I mean, at different times in my life, it has been uh, Dr. Claypool, his colleague, later years, John. Uh, uh, and I, Doug, I, I think you're right about uh, Claypool, and it, it occurred to me that uh, some work very hard and achieve that academic distinction of doctor, uh, but only uh, the really famous uh, rise to a point where they begin to lose that uh, distinction, uh, and uh, it's, it's that same way in, in popular culture. You, you have. Uh, Elvis and Oprah and uh, Obama and uh, you, you don't need any other term either a first name or a last name um, certainly uh, for all of us uh, John Claypool uh, has risen to that uh, stature uh, 
I want to make just two or three points given uh, the, the view of the time here. Uh, first, uh, to say that uh, Claypool's years here at Crescent Hill uh, were the formative years of his ministry. I have to qualify that a little bit. I wish I knew more about his preaching, his sermons uh, at uh, Gilead and at uh, First Baptist uh, Hartful. Uh, that would make an interesting study to see how preaching patterns and themes developed prior to his coming here. Uh, and I, I simply don't have that. But uh, it seems to me that his, his preaching, his style of ministry, his leadership, uh, his theology, uh, all uh, were formed in a significant new way during the 11 years that he was pastor uh, here at Crescent Hill, which again has to be qualified to say that doesn't mean that he didn't go on developing and growing and uh, getting new insights and uh, ways of uh, expressing uh, his thought in, in later years. That's certainly true. <clears throat> but uh, the, the period of formation uh, here uh, at Crescent Hill, I think, uh, is unparalleled. It further needs to be said, uh, and I was struck by this in going back and putting together the material for the Crescent Hill chapter in the book, uh, what a violent, traumatic, turbulent uh, decade uh, the 60s were. Uh, we, we know that, but I think those of us of, of this age uh, tend to forget that. In some ways, uh, it strikes me, we are in a similar decade now but in other respects, we are somewhat inured. Uh, it's, the, the media is too constant, the bombings, the mass shootings. The... But in the 1960s, the country had just come out of the uh, tremendous uh, sense of unity and common purpose of the World War II era, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, almost false uh, uh, peace, uh, prosperity, uh, hopefulness of the 1950s, and then in such an unexpected way <clears throat> for many to, to have the 1960s land. I won't try to go back over and recap that, of course, but just a, a moment to reflect and think about Claypool uh, as a young minister in the midst of all of this. <clears throat> 1968, pivotal year for him uh, as well as for the country. <clears throat> uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King. Riots in Louisville. Last part of May, early June. Uh, John goes home tired on a Tuesday evening, six o'clock, supper time, exhausted. <clears throat> the telephone rings. He's needed downtown as a chaplain at the police station. Of course he goes. And as he tells about it the next uh, Sunday, uh, there in that hell hole of a holding room, uh, uh, a black man, his face bleeding because he was trying to stop rioters, looters. John finds common touch with him, gives him the clean handkerchief from his own pocket. A white officer comes in <clears throat> with an unusually agitated white man arresting him. That man was a classmate in his senior class in high school. A black officer brings in black teenagers who are cursing the black officer. And John found there a place of need, uh, human tragedy, and of course, he brought his own sense of uh, ministry and 
uh, effort to convey God's grace uh, even in that place. The next week, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. Within days, he receives Laura Lou's diagnosis. What a period. Out of that, <clears throat> of course, uh, his, his preaching interacting with all of those events, personally, nationally, around Louisville. Uh, what we have come to speak of as confessional preaching. And I think for most people, uh, there's the assumption that Confessional preaching is something John began to do uh, in the sermons and tracts of a fellow struggler. We associate those. Uh, I would argue that's uh, a misunderstanding and that there were strong confessional elements in his preaching before that time as he spoke of his struggle with a, a sense of uh, self-worth of having to achieve uh, his experience in college. Uh, Mars Hill, his roommate saying, what happens to you makes a difference to me. Uh, John continually drew from the, from the reserve of his own experience. Uh, and then just briefly, uh, a third point. And of course that that confessional preaching, to back up a second, uh, it was in a period where across the land in Southern Baptist pulpits, you were hearing sermons that were expository uh, and evangelistic. And John brought a different frame, a different vantage point uh, to his uh, whole uh, ministry of preaching. But a final point uh, is he's developing, working out his theology, which of course he had been doing from uh, certainly his student days. Uh, but it, it strikes me, uh, looking back over it, John's preaching, teaching, his theology uh, was in a specific sense theocentric. Whereas most pastors, preachers at that time were talking about Jesus, John said relatively less, not to say a little, certainly less about Jesus. His focus was on the character of God. And so the uh, Eliot controversy, John leads the church in a study of Genesis 1 to 11, which became absolutely central uh, in his understanding of God. Creation, God's uh, uh, gift love, to take the term he borrowed from C.S. Lewis, out of the joy of being and life to share that, to bring others, to bring us uh, into being and to give us life all about the character of God. The incarnation, Jesus, the expression of God's love to come uh, and in the Johannine sense become flesh and abide with us. The resurrection, uh, for John it was not God's ability that he was able to bring Jesus to life. It was that he was willing to bring Jesus to life. Where, and it doesn't mean that, that Claypool had a, a weak uh, Christology, to get into theology a sense. He had a high Christology, I would argue, in that he saw in Jesus revelation of God. And that was the direction of his thought from Jesus to the character of God. And then uh, in terms of resurrection, whereas so many others were preaching judgment, uh, John preached a, a sermon with a heavy emphasis on uh, envy and greed as he did so many themes out of life experience and ended it with two stories I won't take time to tell 
illustrating uh, a, a man driven by uh, greed and envy and another story of uh, uncommon generosity. And he's closing line, and those closing lines are always classic. And he says, you see, when we meet God, God will be weeping. But he will, will he be weeping tears of grief or tears of joy? That's the spin on judgment and hope in Claypool's thought. The gospel according to John Claypool. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm not going to be speaking any theology. Uh, and I could speak for about, oh, an hour, but I don't think you want to hear me that, that long. So uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is tell you a few things. First of all, uh, on the podium down here are two sheets of paper. First is a list of all of the staff people that worked under Dr. Claypool when he was here at Creston Hill Baptist Church. It was a huge staff. <laughs> and so any remembrance of John would have to include remembrance of all the staff that worked with him, of course, including Dwight Cobb, who's a youth minister, and, and David Graves uh, is here, and a lot of other people, Bob Myers, we all knew these people. And uh, so there's a list down there, but those who want that, uh, that was available to you. I'm not going to go through that. But we have to appreciate those people, too, as part of the legacy of, of uh, Dr. Claypool. Uh, the other thing that I included, there's a, um, uh, copies of the only sermon that he preached at this, in this pulpit, in this uh, sanctuary, 1983, that we have recording of. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. He preached there nine years, and we don't have any, any uh, or 11 years, we don't have no, no audio recordings because we did a, a reel to reel, and every, year, every Sunday we just record over the, uh, over the, over the, uh, the previous year. So when he came back in 1983, we were able to record his sermon, and we transcribed it. My wife's uh, trans uh, copy of the office over there. Anyone who wants to pick up a copy, it's on the Samaritan, a wonderful sermon. Uh, at the end of that sermon, he gave his benediction, his classic benediction, and 15 years ago, I, I took that benediction and recorded it and put it on YouTube, and it's now on YouTube, you can look at it. It's had about 5,000 uh, hits, and, uh, but that's the, that's the classic uh, Claypool recording, but that's the only, only time we have that recorded. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail, is that when Dr. Claypool, can you hear me? Okay, when Dr. Claypool was here, uh, I, well, first of all, let me back up. Alan called me about two years ago and asked me if I could collaborate with him uh, writing this uh, chapter on the book. And if I could go through some of the archives that we have over here, and I'm the archivist, and so we have a chance to go through some of those. So we got all of his sermons and his uh, Beams articles and all that kind of thing, and I made an inventory of all those. And I want you to know that when Dr. Claypool was here, he preached 600 sermons. 600 unique different sermons. Preached two different sermons on Sunday morning, one on Sunday night, and one on Wednesday often. That's 600. <laughs> Blows my mind to think about that. Okay, now, I want to go back into a deal a little bit deeper into one episode of Claypool's life. Uh, <clears throat> Doug uh, showed the, the picture, the iconic picture of uh, Claypool with uh, Martin Luther King over at the seminary, and we all know that story. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a few more details about that. now. The, the church has a, a newsletter called The Beams, uh, and it comes out every, every week, a little newsletter. There was no mention that Dr. King was going to be preaching at the seminary. <clears throat> Dr. Claypool arranged to be in a, in a revival service in Denmark, South Carolina that week. Okay. And that was announced to The Beams. And uh, so when Dr. Uh, <clears throat> King came, actually David Gray's father, Alan uh, Graves picked him up at the airport and brought him over here because uh, Duke McCall was out of town. <laughs> uh, so, so Dr. King comes here. Oh, Dr. Claypool was in South Carolina. Well, how could he be here? Well, guess what? And I don't know for sure, but he caught on a plane in South Carolina, flew up here to, um, to hear King on Wednesday, got back in the plane and flew back to South Carolina, finished the revival, and then Beam's article the next Sunday after King had spoken here, said, welcome back, Dr. Claypool. <laughs> well, 
If the Courier Journal had not published that picture, nobody would have known that he was here. But the Courier did, and guess what? The deacons were mad. <laughs> and so they had a special meeting for him that Monday night, and he really got, took hell, as, as, as Ron has mentioned. Well, and then uh, Dr. Claypool preached the following Sunday, did not mention King's uh, sermon at all. Anyway, I thought that was very fascinating to me, how, how Claypool was so determined to hear King that he made that special effort to do that. Okay, one other point, uh, just to, to round out what I'm going to say is, you're going to hear a little bit later about uh, Broadway's experience with women in ministry, women deacons, all kind of thing. When Dr. Claypool was here, uh, that issue never came up. He never dealt with that. However, he was very inclusive. And uh, I guess it was in November, Dr. Claypool left in October. In November, there was a business meeting, and there was a lady named Cannon Hyde. <laughs> She's sitting right out there. Got up in the business and said, could we have deacons in this church? Well, nobody ever thought about that. Uh, although they had an American Baptist Convention for a long time. But, she got, and so the church got to head a little study, and sure enough, the next year, next year the church voted to have deacon, uh, have women as deacons, to be ordained as, as deacons. And so that was thanks to, uh, to Cannon. But, Cannon, you want to stand up? <laughs> okay, all right. So that, that was a, what a legacy, but he set the groundwork for, for inclusiveness uh, that, that lasted throughout his ministry. So I'm going to pause at that, that section. I did want to say one thing more, just, to, just as a tip off to, uh, to Dr. Henson. Uh, Dr. Henson was instrumental in letting uh, Dr. Claypool get to meet uh, Thomas Merton down at the uh, monastery. And that had a big impact on uh, Claypool becoming a contemplative in, in his life, too. So I'm going to pause. Okay. Um, I don't, this mic's not working. There is another mic that's working. Is it, is it working? Y'all can hear me? I don't think the mic's on. It's just, yeah, that that's that would be helpful. Okay. <laughs> well, now this one doesn't work. Okay. Um, we'll try not to share the mic too much, but uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Glenn Jonas is um, a professor of religion, professor, of, excuse me, Charles Howard, professor of religion and associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Campbell University. Uh, he's done a lot of study on uh, Claypool's work from 71 to 76 at uh, Broadway, and has probably read as many sermons from that Broadway era as uh, anyone, and uh, those have been, of course, a blessing and a curse for we who followed Claypool because <laughs> Uh, we would have to read those and go, hmm, I'm preaching the same lectionary text, but uh, what a gift they are to the, to the history of uh, our church and more broadly understanding Claypool's ministry. And so I welcome you to speak uh, about those Broadway years. Thank, thank you, Ryan. And uh, thank, thank you all for the invitation to, to be here this weekend. And and uh, thanks to my friends Doug and Aaron Weaver for, for asking me to write this chapter in the book. Uh, I, am, uh, I am one of those uh, that Doug mentioned earlier. I did not know John Claypool personally. I, I met him on a couple of occasions. Uh, the first time I met uh, John was in uh, 1978 when I was a sophomore at Mars Hill College. and. Um, he came and delivered our Staley lectures at, at, at Mars Hill, and, and I remember one of my professors uh, uh, trying to you know, tell us in class, in one of our religion classes, who John Claypool was and the significance of John Claypool, and he mentioned uh, Tracks of a Fellow Struggler and, and what, what the book was about and the death of Laura Lou. And, and so I went to the lectures and was just captivated with, uh, with John Claypool from that point on, and um, uh, I, I was a member at Broadway Baptist Church for a period of time when I was a student at Southwestern Seminary. Uh, Cecil Sherman was the pastor at Broadway uh, during the time that I was a member there. And uh, then I went on down to Baylor and, and completed my, my uh, and did my PhD and, and moved over to North Carolina. And through the years, 
I have served as interim pastor of a number of different congregations, and in my preaching, I quote John Claypool all the time. I, I uh, uh, he, he has been quite influential on on the way that the way that I preach, and he's also been very influential on me personally as I've grappled with with uh, growing through life and the and the questions of life and so forth that we that we all deal with. So that's that's kind of how it, and and I did I did hear John Claypool one other time deliver some lectures at Barton uh, College over in Eastern North Carolina. And it, it must have been just a year or two before he passed away. And I remember going up to him and introducing myself and, and talking about the time that he was at Mars Hill College and he remembered that and he was very grateful that, that I had been at that. And, and so I did not know him personally like, like many of you did, but, but he uh, certainly had an impact on on my life and and um, um, and my ministry, uh, the, the the chapter that I wrote on on uh, his years at Broadway, I looked at at three basic things. Obviously, the preaching, and I also looked at at some of the scholarship that he was able to continue to do while he was at Broadway, and then I looked just a little bit at administration. I, I don't I, those of you that knew him a lot better than I did. Uh, Administration was not the most enjoyable part of ministry for, for John, I, I don't think. And, and uh, he was pretty open about that in, in some places. And, and, but I did feel like in the chapter I needed to mention that aspect of his ministry because after all, Broadway in, in, uh, in, in the uh, 1970s was a church that had 5,000 members and, and it was uh, quite an administrative uh, uh, chore that he took on. The one thing that I do want to highlight uh, uh, before I pass the mic along is, is, is the, the issue of gender equality. That, as many of you know and many of you remember, in the early 1970s, that starts to become an issue. The Equal Rights Amendment um, uh, was in the background of, of all of that, and, and we began talking about those things in, in churches, in the mainline denominations. And, and also in Baptist churches, and it and it surfaced in his uh, in, in John's years at Broadway in 1973. It was actually December of 73, and then in 1974, they uh, uh, Broadway ordained a young woman by the name of Jeanette Zachary to the ministry. Uh, she was a student at Southwestern. The deacons were unanimous uh, uh, about her ordination. She uh, was at the time uh, working as a chaplain at um, an organization there in Fort Worth and uh, she had aspirations of going into the Air Force and becoming a military chaplain. And so she needed, she needed ordination in order for that uh, process to play out. And so Broadway uh, did ordain her to the ministry uh, on January the 27th of 1974. And, um, and then that, that sort of opened up the discussion of uh, women and women in ministry and those kinds of things at the church. And so later in the year, in, uh, in June of 1975, uh, John preached what I think is one of his finest sermons that, that I've read. It's a sermon called The Bible and Women. It was um, uh, based on Galatians chapter 3, verses 25 through 28. Um, the, uh, the, the, the collection of sermons from Broadway that you received in your packet uh, includes that sermon. I, I think it's just a, just a fine sermon. And, and um, he, uh, he, he talks about uh, Jesus' ministry and he talks about how uh, uh, the Apostle Paul made a significant change in his life when he became a follower of Jesus and, and uh, that Paul would have been schooled in a tradition where women would not have been regarded with any kind of uh, equality. And, and so he says that's what sort of makes Galatians 3.28 such a revolutionary text is it came from a, from a, uh, uh, from a, from a Pharisee that, that was not schooled in that tradition. And, and therefore he must have gotten that idea from Jesus and, and from what he knew of, of Jesus' ministry. Thought, an, an interesting thought. Um, he talks about uh, uh, the woman at the well in, in John chapter 4. 
And uh, there are other places in John's preaching where he where he hits that uh, that particular text. Um, it, it is as um, uh, of course Alan, uh, being a, being an expert on John, would, would know this. Uh, I, I don't think I'm mistaken. It's the longest narrative conversation that Jesus has with anyone in the Gospels, um, and and he has it with this Samaritan woman, and and uh, John John picks up on that. Uh, and, and talks about that, that uh, um, um, experience of Jesus meeting with, with this woman in Samaria. Another sermon that he preached on another occasion at Broadway um, was also on, this, on, on John chapter 4 and the Samaritan woman. But it was a sermon that he preached just before Labor Day. And there was a fascinating take that he did uh, where he talks about Jesus being exhausted and as he comes into Samaria and this encounter with this woman at the well energized Jesus at, at, at the end of the experience. And I thought that's an interesting, uh, an interesting perspective that, that John drew. And, and, and of course, he, he is, um, uh, again, uh, highlighting the, the, the gender issue there. So the, the, the sermon on uh, uh, the Bible and women that he did. Um, uh, he also talks about Mary and Martha and the experience of uh, uh, you know, Martha going in the kitchen and doing the work and Mary sitting and talking to Jesus. But Jesus extends to Martha the, the invitation to, to come and listen. And, and, uh, and, and so he has a, a fascinating take on that as well. So I won't recount the entire sermon for you, but, but <clears throat> it, is a, it is a very uh, important sermon I think that that he preached, particularly in that day and time. Well, Broadway, uh, that the idea behind the sermon, I think, was to set the stage for the discussion that Broadway was going to have later in the year uh, about the possibility of ordaining deacons, uh, ordaining women deacons, and. Uh, believe it or not, that, that was a little bit controversial at, at Broadway. Uh, and I found it surprising that they had, they had ordained a, a woman to the ministry the year before, and yet it, or, or just a few months before, and then it becomes a controversial issue about having women deacons. And the only thing that I could, only conclusion that I could draw from that was that, um, at, at least in the minds of the deacons at, at that point in time, they saw a difference between a woman involved in congregational leadership and a woman involved in, in chaplaincy. And um, so, so John preached this sermon and then the, the, um, uh, the church initiated a, or the deacons initiated a, a conversation about um, uh, whether or not to, to ordain women as deacons. And the church held a straw vote uh, about it. Uh, on November the 1st of 1975, the deacons decided to, to just do a straw vote, sort of take the temperature of the congregation. And uh, I found in the, in the archives at Broadway when I was doing this work, uh, there, there were a total of 850 ballots that were cast. Um, and uh, they had the categories, very strong agreement, meaning very strong agreement for ordaining women as deacons, was 31.3% of the vote. Fairly strong agreement was 18.82% of the vote. Neither strong agreement nor disagree, 16.35% uh, of the vote. And then fairly strong disagreement, 12.12%, and very strong disagreement was 21.41%. So almost a, uh, uh, it would be uh, almost a third of the congregation was uh, disapproving of the idea. So the deacons decided to just sort of table the matter for the moment. And eventually in 1981, um, Broadway does ordain uh, women deacons. And, uh, but I thought that was just a fascinating moment in, in John's ministry when he's, when he's really trying to, to, um, uh, to move the church in, in this direction. And it just didn't quite make it at, at the time. Dr. Jones, thank you so much. Um, I was chuckling with Charlie saying, I wonder if I know any of those 21%. Uh, uh, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> uh, not at this point. Uh, I, I do wish to echo and commend that, particularly that sermon 
um, uh, on the Bible and women as uh, someone who's read many John Claypool sermons. Uh, this is an extraordinary sermon, even by his standards, I, I believe, and, and also a very timely one uh, more broadly. And I do wish to thank Jen LeBeau, who put together those, that collection of sermons uh, for Broadway, and I appreciate her making several, I think, very wise selections. And uh, they really speak to the, I think, the robustness of his pastoral ministry. Oh, the mic's on. Uh, the robustness of his pastoral ministry from the pulpit, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, the last sermon in there, uh, there was a, a, an error in uh, the, the copying process, and it just sort of trails off like the original uh, uh, Gospel of Mark just ends suddenly. <laughs> uh, there is a QR code, however, that you can access and go to and actually hear the sermon preached. So I hope that you'll have the take the opportunity uh, to please do that. We already had introduction to Doug Weaver who did such a fantastic, fantastic job uh, giving the overview of Claypool's life earlier this morning. Uh, but today he's on the panel to speak a little more in depth about the experience there in Jackson. So we're really grateful to have uh, Dr. Weaver back with us uh, for this particular panel as well. Thanks, Ryan. Um, let me say one thing about the title of the book. Uh, it's called Claypool, and that's it. And the reason for that is because Buddy Sheridan and the people at McAfee have uh, a lingo they call bumper sticker statements from John Claypool, Claypoolisms. And then uh, Buddy talks about Claypoolology. And so, but Buddy Sheridan was the one that told me, you have to, you have to title this book Claypool, nothing else. That's good. So, Rowan, that's why. It's just Claypool. Um, I do want to give a shout out to my son, Aaron. Uh, it's been fun to do. You don't often do an academic that's thing good. with your son. Uh, and we, we edited this book, but also we co-wrote the Northminster book. And Kelly, it really was 50-50. I was the one that wrote the, the Claypool chapter. But nevertheless, uh, he went to Jackson and did some oral interviews, uh, and there were already some oral interviews there, and he worked through those, so we really did work together. But just to give you a little human, I want to focus on only one thing, but before I do that, to give you a little human side of Claypool, um, Aaron interviewed a guy named Mike at uh, Northminster, and they used to play racquetball, and Claypool would play racquetball to you know, kind of self-care. And Peters comes back from the uh, racquetball game and says, oh, I just love playing racquetball with him. My gosh, he loves to win. He'll hit me in the head with the ball. And he'll even cuss. My preacher cusses. <laughs> and it just, that won the day. I mean, you know, you got Charlie, that just wins the day. That's um, I want to <laughs> share with you the one question you might have, and, and I do deal with it in, in some of these writings, and that is, so how about the journey towards sacramental theology mm -hmm. in John Claypool? The easy answer is between 82 and 85, when he's studying uh, the Episcopal tradition, he had read William Temple, he had read C.S. Lewis, and that kind of thing. He's in discussions with Episcopal ministers priest and that's the easy answer is that when it's flowers and that's when it uh, and then after that I mean he graduates and gets ordained as a deacon and a priest that's the easy answer but if you want to back up a little bit I've read some sermons from Broadway uh, I've read extensively from North Minister and there is a there's a journey for him so when it comes to baptism he's a typical Baptist at Broadway and at North Minster where baptism is for adults meaning someone who is someone who is old enough to know what they're doing however at that age is remember he was nine um and but it is believers baptism by immersion and even in northminster he says we don't baptize infants although they did accept members which call open membership by statement of faith he didn't have to have the infamous uh rebaptist but he does have a very very baptist maybe a progressive baptist he has a very baptist view of baptism uh, his understanding of Lord's Supper at Broadway and at uh, Northminster to me is, is quite fascinating. It's, it's still Baptist. It's what you call memorial, the memorial understanding. Uh, you do this in remembrance of me. 
But it's, it's not a simple memory. He always talks about uh, symbols that uh, are embedded with spiritual realities. And you can see that language, uh, especially at Northminster, but I saw it toward the end at, at, uh, at Broadway. Um, it, he does use the word ordinance, but when he's at Northminster, he changes and uses the word sacrament. That's when you begin to see the word sacrament. Uh, he talks about, uh, he doesn't like the word observe, and so this happens at Northminster. He begins to say, I just don't like observing the Lord's Supper. I want to talk about celebrating the Lord's Supper. He thought observing was external, was, you know, you can do it. If you don't do it, it's a big deal. And so he's really picking out of the Catholic tradition. And he talks about the, the Catholic participation in the sacrament so that it grabs you. But this is something I've never seen in anybody else, for any of y'all who have pastoral experience. He explains at Broadway and at Northminster about how you take uh, Lord's Supper. He does not use the word Eucharist until he's uh, out of the Baptist tradition. If he did it at Lubbock, I, I don't know, but he didn't do it at Broadway or Northminster. But he does do this. In a, in a typical Baptist church, Lord's Supper uh, is where the, the deacons would bring the uh, elements, the bread and the cup to you. And he says that in the, you know, in the Episcopal tradition, you walk up front. He tells a story about dating a, a young woman from an Episcopal church when he was a teenager and says, well, I wonder why they do it different from us. And so at Broadway and at Northminster, he explains it this way. He says the Baptist get it right when people bring it to you and you don't do anything but receive it. It's divine initiative and you receive the element. He said the Episcopal tradition does it right in that you go forward. It is something you have to do yourself. So it's this mix between this collaboration between divine initiative in human response. And so that's how he tried to explain Lord's Supper really when he was at Broadway and at Northminster. I read a couple of sermons, had a student uh, transcribe them for me from the uh, uh, period in Birmingham at St. Luke's, and he has flipped it because he is now affirming uh, baptism as uh, of the infant and, and the covenant relationship, and he now says that baptism is the time where you do nothing and that God has done it all for you. And so you don't need to have an awareness of that. But he still will talk about the uh, Eucharist in terms of this divine and human uh, initiative. But what I found fascinating, and he, so he raises this question. Well, if baptism is now at the entrance of your life as, as the infant, he says, so how, how do we balance this out? And he talks about the human response is in the Episcopal tradition where you uh, have a renewal of your baptismal covenant and the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. So he really does flip, but he does have a, he does have a balanced theology, and that's what I would lead to you. When he uh, talks about baptism and Lord's Supper, Eucharist, for him it is divine initiative, uh, human response, not one or the other, and he simply plays it out. So finally, what, what is his fulfillment spiritually? I mentioned this earlier. And the fulfillment spiritually for him is the reception of the Eucharist and the giving of the Eucharist. It becomes, uh, it is a pastoral act that he receives from God and then he can share with his parishioners. And I do think there is a journey towards sacramental theology that really begins uh, seriously at Northminster, a little bit at, at Broadway, and then it flowers, uh, you know, 82. Uh, and on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Doug. As I understand it, we will be uh, uh, partaking in communion uh, in, in um, multiple ways on Sunday. It's kind of a reflection and celebration of that fact, so I look forward to that as well. Charlie Johnson is the Executive Director of Pastors for Texas Children, also pastor at Bread Fellowship in Fort Worth. A uh, longtime friend, uh, someone who sat under Dr. Claypool as a youth minister and uh, then later was my pastor at Second Baptist in Lubbock. And um, I'm so very grateful that uh, he's here to share with us today. 
Ryan, thank you very much. What is our end time here? Okay, so oh, uh, the end time has been pushed back to one o'clock, so we've got a little a little extra time. Does everybody want to stand up, take a stretch? Why don't you do that? Let's do that. Don't get carried away about it, but. Uh, <laughs> Are you going to lead us in counseling? You're right. No jumping, James. All right, y'all, let's get started here if, if we can. I, th um, I think we all needed that stretch and get the blood flowing again. And uh, the beautiful thing about uh, good speakers that we've heard today is that it occasions our own uh, remembrance, doesn't it? And if it were logistically possible, everybody would take the microphone. And uh, that leads me, by the way, to add one more piece of furniture to our metaphorical imagination. Pulpit, table, yes, but pew. And what do we do with what we have heard in meaning? What do we do with what we've experienced in mystery? And that is located in the pew, and that is located in all of our hearts. My job is to talk about uh, John's experience at Second Baptist Church of Lubbock and uh, one of the great churches in the Pantheon and all our churches are and isn't it interesting as we celebrate John, we also accentuate the individuality of every congregation. Every congregation has its own character and institution. I had the pleasure of serving in four institutions that John served. Uh, youth minister at Northminster. Kelly and I were talking about it when I was a student at Mississippi College. That's where I met John uh, when he came to Northminster uh, at Second Baptist Church of Lubbock uh, for almost 13 years. I was a young preacher when I went there. Uh, interim pastor at Broadway Baptist in Fort Worth and uh, also visiting uh, instructor in preaching at at McAfee Mercer and in all those places I was able to not only did I know John very intimately John was my pastor and my mentor he preached my ordination Northminster licensed me uh, not only that but I got to hear you talk about John and in the mystery of remembrance and witness and testimony these are three very powerful concepts in our Christian faith. Uh, we know a reality through the words of the other, not always in a direct experience. And so in our, in, in our uh, lives, we may not have known an individual directly, but we nevertheless knew her in her beauty and his power, and that is at work in this uh, uh, meeting also. So many great people here for us all. Uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize my beloved uh, Professor Glenn Henson. Glenn is so instrumental for all of us in the room. Uh, you bet, once again, I think so. Um, there, there are four pieces of remembrance that come to my mind. And these in it are in no particular order about John's three years at Second Baptist. Anne and John were newlyweds, and it was a honeymoon time for them. And they, Anne was joined John as an equal partner in this project of love in that, in that congregation. Second Baptist was a different kind of congregation and this, as we have said, every congregation is. But from the other iconic churches that we have 
mentioned. It was a renegade church. It was out on the western edge of Southern Baptist life. It was progressive in its, uh, in its energy, its sensibility. It didn't sort of stress the legacy uh, and uh, I guess heritage uh, kind of concepts of, you know, not a Southern seminary kind of congregation. It just wasn't. And so for John and Ann, who were Southerners, who were steeped in that kind of Southern, you know, in that kind of Southern seminary ness, to come to love them and to love those people, in that kind of, there's another cross-cultural competency of John. And I just wanted to identify that. And Ann was as powerful in her impact as John was, truly. You know, we have, we have, I think, drilled deep in our remembrance about John's preaching and pastoring, and he did both in a beautiful way. In his love of years, he became a pastor to the city, Texas Tech University community, a pastoral counselor, and uh, in ways that he impacted our lives in that kind of fashion, he did those people also. He was in recovery. He was uh, on his way back to health and strength. And uh, one of the many lines of Claypoolism uh, that comes to my mind is fatigue is a moral category. Fatigue is a moral category. And when we get tired, we become vulnerable to all kinds of distortion. And he, uh, no, he, he got replenished during those love up years. Uh, third, his relationship with, with, as Doug has already said, with the Episcopal Church and this entry from one room, maybe he was in the hallway during the second few years from the Baptist room to the Episcopalian room. Uh, Bishop Henry, Bishop Sam Halsey, very important to John uh, and, and the Episcopal Churches of Lubbock. And you can imagine that West Texas town, what an outlier the Episcopal Church is out there. And so, you know, uh, and at Second Baptist, we were the farm league for the Episcopal <laughs> Church, by the way. Uh, you know, there wasn't any other Baptist church to join unless you moved back to Fort Worth and joined Broadway. So, you know, when folks would leave Second Baptist, and that happened with some regularity, uh, they would join the Episcopal Church. And so there's that, and that's a beautiful thing, and it's a beautiful thing for Father Mark and Bishop Henry to be here with us. And look, John, I, I, told, I told Bishop Parsley, John left the Baptist room, and he entered the Episcopal room, and we didn't want him to leave. And we kept trying to pull him back in our room. And he blessed it, and lots of words of blessing from the Episcopal room, but there's that. And there's a reason why our leader says, wait a minute, and in God, God's house has many rooms. Many rooms. You know, it's just stick around in one room. The last thing is this concept of shared ministry, which our great friend Hardy Clemens explored. And explored with a wonderful productivity and imagination and sort of a, a logistical application. Because Hardy was... And Alan, you knew Hardy very well. A theologian, yes. A great pastoral counselor, yes. But he did have this facility for administration. Yeah. And as one who doesn't, and in celebrating the one who didn't, John, I think we need to say Hardy did something incredible in calling that minister of greater renown than himself and it reminds me of what Jesus said. Hey, don't be calling me so great. You're going to do greater things than I've done. So we have that missional call again, which seems to me, in the limited perspective I have on the Baptist movement, is our great impulse. I don't think we're wonderful thinkers of the faith. I think we're doers of the faith. And I'll just conclude my part by saying another John a piece of wisdom. Nostalgia is the conclusion that God is not up to anything new. Isn't that a wonderful turn of phrase like John could do? And so we're not 
marinating in any kind of nostalgia here. Rowan, thank you for bringing us together. Carolyn and Doug, chroniclers of, Don, of John, all the organizers of this, wonderful. But this is not, we're getting remembered. We're getting put back together in the body, which is the presence of this incredible love in the world. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, we heard a little bit this morning about the, the turn from meaning to mystery, and um, we would certainly be remiss if we did not have Episcopal um, brothers and sisters here amongst us, and we are certainly uh, glad to welcome to, to this panel. Mark Ligori, uh, Reverend Mark Ligori, Ligori, is Professor Emeritus of Sociology and Social Work and the former chair of the department at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, he was really mentored uh, as a, a, a deacon in training under Claypool, and I know that that was a very uh, tender relationship spoken of earlier this morning, and we look forward to hearing more from him. And then along uh, with Reverend Ligori, we also have Bishop Henry Parsley, who uh, we're very honored to have with us today. Uh, from 1996 until Claypool's retirement from St. Luke's, Birmingham, uh, he was Claypool's bishop. I like to hear the sound of that. So, um, Amen. Sometimes we Baptists need a bishop or two. So uh, here is one of them. And uh, we look forward to hearing from these two uh, colleagues and also friends. It's wonderful being thought of as an outlier. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we all are. <laughs> um, it, John was my priest and mentor. He sponsored me for ordination. I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful for Bishop Parsley, who uh, re-invited the, the diaconal order into the Episcopal Church. Uh, and I was in that first class in 2002. John and Ann came to us in March of 1987. John is the fourth rector of St. Luke's and Anne as Saint Anne, who he, he often referred to her from the pulpit. Uh, it was an incredible ministry, 14 years long, which I understand was the longest ministry in, uh, in John's life as a minister in the church. It was incredibly successful. Um, we moved from two to four services during that period of time. We went from a couple of hundred people attending Sunday services to a little over a thousand uh, by the time John ended his ministry with us. Um, we sent out 500 tapes a month of John's sermons and preaching his uh, Sunday school classes and Wednesday classes. Incidentally, if you read his sermons and you hear his sermons, you only get a part of who John was as a preacher and priest because the nonverbal communication, uh, anyone who's experienced John can, can testify to the fact that there was a magic there that is almost indescribable. Yeah. Um, it, I've heard it already mentioned that uh, John, when he preached, he preached directly to you. Mm -hmm. You saw him looking at you and speaking those words, those meaningful words, words directly to you on Sunday morning. I don't know how he did it. Uh, I tried it in, in some of my college classes and forget about it. <laughs> the, John had a saying that we were called 
to be faithful, not to be successful. And um, I think we can all t attest to the fact that John was both an incredibly successful minister who was also incredibly faithful to scripture and to the people he served. I want to tell you a story about how John came to St. Luke's because he almost didn't. Um, and it involves a friend of mine who at the time was 45 years old. She's 82 now. Uh, she was on the search committee. And the search committee had, there were about 20 members of that committee. And um, they had gathered 150 names to succeed the, uh, the rector who had been there for 20 years. But this woman, Emmy McGowan, wasn't convinced that we had the right person yet. And so she started using her social capital, that's my sociology, in getting in, into this, and spent it in wise ways. She understood that a, one, one of her uh, uh, Episcopal priest friends was coming through town, his name was Richard Cube, and she invited him to dinner. And um, somewhere during the dinner, she pushed this list of 150 names in front of this gentleman, whose name was Richard Q, and asked him to look at the names, and obviously took some time with that. But Richard said to Emmy, that's a fine list of names. It's a pretty exhaustive list of names but you're missing one person. His name is John Claypool. And he said, you, you're missing him because he hasn't even been a priest yet for a year. But put him on your list. And so she did, and she brought it back to, to uh, the search committee, and um, then she started researching among her friends, and she called the, uh, the former vice chancellor of Swanee, the Episcopal University of the South, and said, what do you think about this fellow, Claypool? I hadn't heard of him before, and, and, and the, the former chancellor said, you got a winner here. He said, you know, you, you need to push him uh, on the search committee. And she said, well, is there any negative, you know, in, in all of this? And he said, yeah, pity the guy who follows him. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it was prophetic because the guy who followed him didn't last but a year. <laughs> the, at the end of this, there were two people that uh, wound up being candidates, and John was one of them. But he was somewhat controversial because he didn't meet any of our criteria. He'd only been a priest for a year. He had been a Baptist all of his life up until that that time. Um, he was divorced. He had some challenges in his life that had led him into uh, psychiatric care for a while. Um, and there were some folks on that committee that didn't like that. You know, we wanted someone a little bit more traditional. And the, the fellow who was leading, the bishop's advisor to, to the committee, said to, to the committee at some point as they're wrangling, look, who better to minister to the broken, of which every one of us are, than to someone who celebrates his brokenness and shares it with us. John Claypool 
was my priest. He was, a, and in spite of all the wonderful sermons he gave and all the wonderful teachings he, he gave, I think it's fair to say that first and foremost, John was our priest. John was our priest. And I, I want to conclude what I have to say with something that links to something that Doug said. John had a way of ministering to you so that you felt like you were his best friend. He had a thousand best friends at St. Luke's. And he, he did it by paying full attention to you. When you were with him, it was as if there were no other. Like Jesus yeah. with his disciples yes. and with his crowds, his 5,000 in that Sermon on the Mount. John, when he gave us communion, changed the words around a little. I don't know if the bishop had known about it, he might have asked him to change him back. But, but what John said to each of us as he engaged us with his eyes, he said, may this be for you, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Not this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, but a wish for you, a connection for you, between meaning and mystery, between God and you, that was personal. There are very few people, very few priests, who give communion that way. Sometimes it's like handing a deck of cards out to everybody. But for John, it was the most important connection he had with us. John was my priest. I thank God for that. Amen. And now my bishop. <laughs> Bringing up the rear, as bishops do in our tradition. <laughs> uh, we always walk at the end of the line. Uh, that's the tradition in the Episcopal Church, and I'm glad to be here at the end of this line. Uh, two stories come to mind. The first triggered by the absence of electric uh, current and lights in the, in the church. When I first came in I, I, and realized there were no lights, I thought, oh my, this reminds me of a story that I heard when I first came to the Diocese of Alabama about John Claypool at St. Luke's. Uh, his first Sunday, according to the story, the electricity went out in the church. What is it with John and electricity? <laughs> and during the procession, the lights went out, the organ stopped, and the procession became a silent procession. And as they got toward the altar, it all came back on and the organ boomed out and a member of the church named Bill said to his wife, here comes John the Baptist. That's <laughs> fantastic. That was true and that's a great story. And that's, the second story is true and actually these lead up to something, believe it or not. When I first came to Alabama, John invited me in his generosity to preach and celebrate Christmas Eve, which is one of the key services of the year in our tradition, Midnight Mass, as it's called. And I said, John, I'd be honored to do that, but I want you to preach because I haven't heard you preach in 25 years. And he said, well, I'll be happy to preach if you want me to. So I celebrated and John preached. And my wife and college age son were in the congregation in that pew you talked about so meaningfully. And after John's sermon, my son, who was, you know, lifelong uh, Episcopal uh, person, looked at his mother and said, wow, he preaches like a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Now, that's a true story. I, the other one I think is true too, but I say all that because I think as I, as I sit here in the midst of, of, of this wonderful group of faithful Christian people, most of you from the Baptist tradition, uh, I think about how the Christian church, the body of Christ, is both afflicted and blessed by our denominational differences. We're afflicted by the divisions that they create, but we're blessed by the variety and differences they bring to us. Uh, Jesus was prophetic when he said, in my Father's house are many rooms. You know, we Southerners like the word mansions. <laughs> Sounds better than rooms. But many dwelling places. And, and we think about Jesus <coughs> saying that about the next life, you know, the life to come. But in fact, it also involves this life. As I think John said when he talked about moving from one room in God's house to another. Uh, we have many rooms. And I, John Claypool brought to the Episcopal Church the best of your Baptist traditions. The love of wonderful preaching, the love of, of a proclamation that draws people to commitment and dedication of their lives, uh, an articulated faith, and that enriched the Episcopal Church. And we were blessed to have John among us. Where his journey toward the Episcopal Church started, I can't say for sure, but one of the coincidences of our life is that I first went to be rector of a church in Charlotte, North Carolina called Christ Church, right around the corner from Myers Park Baptist Church, which is a rather famous church in your tradition. Um, and the first clergy conference in North Carolina, Bob Estill, my bishop, asked John Claypool to come and speak, and he gave the clergy conference and I was moved by his theology, his, uh, his marvelous spirit of hope, uh, his wounded healingness, his wicked sense of humor. And I had no idea that, you know, how many years later, 10 years later, I would be called to be his bishop after he had gone to St. Luke's in Birmingham. Uh, God's middle name is Surprise, as <laughs> Carolyn reminded us today. It was from uh, John's desk and telephone that I was called to, uh, to be told of my election as Bishop of Alabama, and John was on the call on the phone, and from that very moment we became such good friends and colleagues, and I can't tell you how supportive John was of me as bishop of the diocese, that which is the gathering of all the churches in that part of Alabama. Uh, he always had a wise word for us. When we gathered together to deal with controversial matters, John often had a way of balancing the issues, bringing people of different persuasions together, reminding us not to get too torn apart by the urgency of whatever controversy faced us, but remember who we are and what we're called to be about. He did that again and again. Uh, being a bishop can be kind of tough duty, and, and John never failed to um, be a source of encouragement and support for me. I think being a newcomer to our tradition, he understood it a lot better than some of the natives did. Um, he actually appreciated having a bishop, <laughs> which is not always true of all the Episcopal clergy. Um, he actually appreciated the, the sense of diocesan community that, that brought a diversity to the whole body of Christ in the Episcopal Diocese of Alabama. Uh, and I, he reminded me of certain phrases, some of which we've already heard today, like the worst thing is never the last thing. There were a few moments as bishop when I needed to be reminded of that. <laughs> I remember once I'd stuck my neck way out to get a woman off of death row in Alabama. It's a long, complicated story. She had, she had been baptized in prison, having been put on death row for a, a complicated murder situation. And 
had become an Episcopalian anyway, I wrote the governor and asked him to consider commuting her sentence to life, which he did. And I got more hate mail for weeks after that than I could ever have imagined. And I remember John called me and said, just remember, my friend Henry, he said, you know, if you're doing God's work, you always don't get a lot of heat. That's just the way it is. And yes, I needed to hear that. I think the root of John's call to the Episcopal Church ultimately came way back when, when he was here at Crescent Hill, and he tells the story in, in opening blind eyes about an Episcopal clergyman who said some important things to him at a clergy gathering once when John was struggling with his restlessness and his concern about being successful and feeling a lot of pressure and stress. And this Episcopal clergyman was Bob Estill, the, the bishop who I mentioned earlier uh, in North Carolina. And, and at that point, Estill reminded uh, John that, you know, he didn't have to be the light that God had already called him light. You are the light, Jesus said. You don't have to earn it. And as John put it, I felt like I was an emptiness needing to be filled by success. But I realized that I was actually a fullness by the creative gift of God. Uh, I think somehow that moment with Bishop, then to be Bishop Estel, uh, was, was what got him moving in a slightly different direction in his spiritual life. And for me, John combined the best of the evangelical tradition of the word preached and proclaimed with the sacramental Catholic tradition of the table. Uh, I would say almost for John, the Eucharist, the table became almost like the altar call in your tradition. We are actually called to get up and receive gift of grace, and by getting up, committing yourself yes. to being a living member of the body of Christ Amen. and active in the world. Amen. And, and I think for John, he was such a brilliant preacher, as we've all said and, and known. But I think at that point in his life, the, the table became the moment of gift that reminded him that it's not just about the word, it's also about the bread and the wine and the mystery. As he put it in the tape this morning, the meaning and the mystery, word and sacrament. John put those together in a wonderful way that I could, as a lifelong Episcopalian, uh, I, I, he made me appreciate my own tradition better than I had before because his understanding of that balance was something I had never really thought about. And so he brought me a great gift to value my own tradition even better. The other day I was trying to come up with a sermon and um, I picked out a book out of my library and out of it fell a sermon reprint from Northminster Baptist Church. <laughs> given by John Claypool. I don't recall ever seeing it before in my life, but it fell out of this book. Um, and in it, this was 1977, John said this, God is not essentially a static, immobile reality who simply appears, but a forward-moving, dynamic power whose watchword is, I will, I can, I promise. If you want to know where to find God, he's usually out ahead, beckoning us to move with him into the wonders of some not yet, but can be. The wonders of some not yet, but can be. I think John might say those words to us today in our own spiritual journeys and our own ministries. 
What is the not yet that we're dealing with in our lives and ministries that can be if we get busy in partnership with God with both meaning and mystery? Yes, life is gift, and John was gift. Thank you to all of our panelists this afternoon. Uh, I, I, I think in the interest of time, uh, I, I think it seems fitting that we end uh, with words from our Episcopal friends and uh, the recognition. I've heard a lot of John's sermons, by the way, and they got shorter over the years. At Broadway, they were 35, 40 minutes, and then uh, later on, uh, he was condensing the content, but um, I think it's really appropriate that we end with the, the words from the bishop. And these words too, may this be the bread of life for you. God bless you all. Amen.